All right. So one of the things that we've noticed in working with different organizations, helping them to stand up software security programs, is that you really need to start to, you know, the people start out a lot of times moving a lot of unstructured data around, email and PDFs, email and Excel spreadsheets, um, you know, doing a lot of things like that. And the, uh, you know, kind of across the board for the programs where we've seen folks start to make headway, you know, they've moved away from this unstructured blobs of information being sent around and started to look at uh, this in a much more data-centric fashion. Uh, and that has a couple benefits. Uh, you know, the one, one obvious benefit we'll talk about is it puts you in a much better position to talk to management uh, and have what we like to call grown-up conversations. Um, but I also think that we've seen a lot of benefits. Um, you know, watching these uh, you know different data sources. If you can treat them as data, you can start to transform that data. You can start to combine them with one another and watch as it flows through the organization. And so, um, what I'm going to talk about today are some of the things that we've seen organizations do, and I'll provide some examples using the open source uh, ThreadFix uh, application that, uh, you know, that we've got out on GitHub, um, so that you potentially can go and look at implementing some of these data flows in your organization you know, with whatever tool set that you've got. Um, that's a picture of me, and I realized this morning that this shirt is the shirt I was wearing in that picture, and <laughs> this coat is also the <laughs> Which means I need to buy more grown-up clothes, I think, is the, is the message to take away from that, but that's fine. Uh, I'm a software developer by background. I started my career in the mid-90s doing a lot of uh, early server-side Java stuff. Spent some time in the early 2000s doing uh, early ASP.NET stuff. Um, but for the last eight, nine, however many years, uh, you know, 10 years now, something like that, um, you know, I've looked at how developers impact the security of organizations that, uh, you know, that, they're, that they're working for. You know, if, as a software developer, how do you have an impact on the security posture of organizations that are deploying the code that you write? Um, and so I have a, uh, you know, I come to this more from a, you know, I think they call them, in OWASP, they call them builders. Uh, you know, I think of myself as coming from a developer background, but one has come into the world of security, which uh, I think provides me a little bit of a different perspective um, versus someone who comes out of uh, like a pen test background who's now looking at web and mobile applications. And I'm also the uh, chapter lead of OWASP San Antonio, uh, and I've been doing a, not a great job this year as the OWASP San Antonio chapter lead. Uh, but, you know, so, uh, you want to run an app security program. How many folks here are, are running or responsible for running an uh, you know, application or a software security program? Excellent. Good. Did you sign a death waiver when you got the job transfer into that? Because uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard job. And so, you know, uh, kind of agenda-wise, we're going to talk through some of the challenges we see uh, organizations face and the reasons for those. Um, we're going to spend the bulk of the time looking at like, how can you start to look at these different activities that you're doing to promote secure software, you know, the testing activities. Uh, you know, uh, John Dixon will be talking next about training activities. We're going to look mainly at uh, the flow of vulnerability data through your organization. What are the sources of data? What are the sinks where that data ends up? And how does that data flow? Again, punctuating that with some examples. Uh, and then we'll talk uh, also about some program metrics and, and tracking. And so application security is, uh, is, is challenging. And the biggest challenge that I've seen is that it spans multiple disciplines and is, you know, is, is comparatively immature. And so you know, if you look in, uh, in, in organizations, the information security group, uh, you know, whether, that's under, uh, you know, whether that's under IT, whether that's under the CFO, wherever that's located, the information security group, uh, usually they're the first folks that get, uh, that get worried about this stuff. Right, you, know, you see uh, you know, notice of breaches in the news, the information security folks are concerned, and a subset of that group is you know, assigned a responsibility for application or software security. Uh, you know, the audit and compliance group probably cares as well, especially with PCI, uh, you know, kind of growing focus in HIPAA on uh, you know, data protection and whatnot. And your risk management, your governance, uh, your risk compliance group uh, you know, care about that. The real problem, or the thing that I think makes application security really challenging, is that the software developers are really where the rubber meets the road. You, know, you have to get them to change their behavior if you want to make measurable progress. Unless your strategy is drop in a WAF and uh, you know, call it a day, which is a strategy. Um, you know, unless that, unless that is your strategy, you're going to have to work with the development teams. And so uh, one of the things we'll talk about are some really successful interaction patterns that we've seen for software security folks working with, uh, working with development teams. 
We've also seen some really unsuccessful patterns of uh, software security folks working with development teams, uh, you know, such as run a scan, generate a 300-page PDF with a color graph on the front page, and email it to the dev team lead telling him that he must be pretty dumb because there's a lot of vulnerabilities that got found in their software. Right. <laughs> that is an anti-pattern for getting, uh, you know, <laughs> for, uh, for uh, you, know, uh, you know, influencing, uh, you know, winning friends and influencing people. Um, and so, uh, so that's one of the things that we're going to look at a lot. And one of the things that we've found to be really critical is how are you communicating with the development teams? How are you setting expectations? And as we look at the data flowing to the development teams, yeah, how well are you taking advantage of the tools that development teams are already using? Right? Or are you asking them to suddenly do something radically different than what they've done in the past? Um, you know, App security, comparatively a new discipline. Uh, you know, phys physical security is an old discipline. Uh, information security kind of new. Application security as a concern is still really new. And so there aren't as many mature metrics, right? There's the metrics that are easy to calculate. You know, how many vulnerabilities do I have per kilolines of code, right? Any uh, you know, static analysis tool, like for free, will crap that uh, metric out for you. And it's not that it's without value, but it's uh, you know, of, of dubious value, or, you know, depending on how it gets used. <clears throat> but the problem with this is you know, in, in different organizations, there's not kind of a standard a set of things that people look at. And you know, certainly not something across the industry. And uh, in addition, what we see are, you know, because this is such a new discipline, there's a new set of tools. And a lot of those are analogs for what we saw in the network security space. Right? We have network security scanners. Now we have application scanners. We have network firewalls. Now we have application firewalls. Right? So we've taken all the bad ideas, or dubious ideas maybe you could say, from, uh, from network and infrastructure security and found a way to port those uh, to, uh, you know, to the uh, application security world. And because they're so new, there aren't standards for how these tools need to interact with one another. And I think that that, you know, what, what we've seen is that causes a lot of trouble. And we'll talk again about some of those anti-patterns going forward. Um, and that's kind of the point of this talk is looking to say, we've got all these different tools. How do we make them actually work together so that they have, uh, you know, a kind of increasing value that you get out of combining these tools, as opposed to each incremental tool creates another silo that another person has to manage. Um, you know, resulting in a lot of cases in an overabundance of Excel spreadsheets um, and too many pivot tables. You know, another challenge with application security is the scale of the problem. Right? There's a whole lot of legacy code out there. Most organizations that value software security, uh, you know, which presumably your organizations value software security because they uh, uh, you know, sent you or at least let you come to a conference for that. Um, you know, most organizations that care about that have a large quantity of applications that they're uh, responsible for. And there's a dearth of qualified professionals. You know, I think even if you look at like, some of the vSIM data, you see it's like a 1 to 100 ratio uh, you know, in, in leading organizations of application security analysts versus developers. Um, you know, that ratio is way worse in, uh, in, in organizations that are not at the, at the forefront. We, you know, we see stuff on either side of that. But uh, I think in, uh, you know, in kind of the uh, software security, 99%, uh, like you see even worse ratios. <coughs> and so, so what does that mean? You know, we've got a huge multidisciplinary problem, right? You can't just throw a pizza box in the network and solve the problem. <coughs> you know, you've actually got to get people to do stuff for you, which is infinitely more frustrating than being able to slap a you know, device on your network or run a scan and call it done. Uh, so we've got a multidisciplinary problem with, you know, again, each discipline has their own set of tools. We've got an area that I don't think as an industry we're very good at characterizing yet from a metrics standpoint. Um, you know, we're starting to see some data come out. Um, you know, if you look at the reports from uh, the, the White Hat folks, the Veracode folks, uh, on the incidence rate of different vulnerabilities and the time to close, I think that's really interesting data, uh, really valuable data. And we'll talk about ways that you can use that um, and, and, and start to benchmark your organization against those third-party sources of data. Um, you know, and we're also in a situation where we're horribly outnumbered. And so what do you do about it? You gather data. And again, I think that looking at this from a data-centric standpoint is really critical to be able to properly characterize the problem and to, like, inside of your organization to start to justify the budget that application security deserves to receive in comparison to other uh, areas of spend like antivirus, like firewalls, and other, you know, other competing concerns. Uh, you know, that's something that uh, you know, a lot of folks have talked about. You know, we're spending a lot of money in these areas. Should the spending be over there, or do we need to be doing more spending over here? If these applications are so valuable that we're spending all this money to create them, if this, uh, you know, if the data managed by these applications is so valuable, you know, is our spend appropriate? 
to protect that value when compared to the amount that is spent to protect uh, you know, your desktop and server and network infrastructure. Um, and one of the things that we've found to be successful is, uh, again, if you have data that you can use to characterize your program, that puts you in a much better situation where you can have a grown-up conversation. Right? And uh, you know, I, I, I joke that you know, we talk to different organizations, and you know, if you go to management and say cross-site scripting is scary, like that's a that's a, a a child's assertion, right? That you're gonna that you're gonna make. You know, uh, you know, we're based out of Texas. You know, work with a number of energy firms. You go to an energy firm and say cross-site scripting is scary. They're gonna tell you we had eight people kidnapped in the Congo last week. That scares me, right? <laughs> or you go to an airline and say, ooh, cross-site scripting is scary, and they're gonna say every time the price of barrel oil moves by a dollar, we lose like 20 million bucks a day, right? Like that actually scares me. Right, and so like those are like when you want to put cross-site scripting in the uh, you know, to juxtapose that with people kidnapped in the Congo and uh, you know, like crazy swings in the finances of business, you know, you have to be able to come with data to at least say, hey, here's the risk we're exposed to, here's the incidence rate, here's the exposure we have because of vulnerabilities, and now as we're starting to see, here's third-party data that we're seeing about you know, how other organizations are performing, here's additional data that we're seeing from Verizon and other data sources about uh, you know, where we see attacks happening. Uh, you know, that starts to put you in a much better position to justify a spend that otherwise you might not be able to justify. And so, again, taking a data-based approach to this is, is a, a tactic that we've found to be a lot more like sustainably successful versus you know, unloading the fear, uncertainty, and doubt like the week after a breach occurs and everybody's scared. <coughs> you also need to communicate to stakeholders. Again, we've got different groups of folks that are involved in this. And so uh, you know, you're going to have to talk to different groups of people. And we'll talk about some of the barriers involved in getting people to work with you and the value in using tools that folks are already using. Right? <clears throat> One of the things that we've looked at a lot is like, how do we take the friction out of the process of fixing vulnerabilities? Finding vulnerabilities, not that hard. Right? Fixing vulnerabilities, uh, you know, from a, from a hands on the keyboard standpoint, often not that hard. There's some outlying cases. Convincing organizations to fix vulnerabilities and to actually take action, that's hard. Um, and communication is something that can help really streamline that. Uh, automation is another thing that is required. You know, we're so outnumbered as software security analysts. We're so outnumbered and the, the you know, task is so daunting that you have to automate everything that is uh, possible. <coughs> and uh, really, you've got to get this set up so it's repeatable, so that you can go through these cycles over and over again. So what does this look like? What we've started to do, uh, you know, both in, internally for our development practice as well as working with other organizations and their dev practices, is to look and say, how do we start to take all these different activities that you're undertaking? You know, to do, you're, you're doing threat modeling, you're doing static scanning, you're doing dynamic scanning. How do we start to automate whatever's possible but start to look at the results of these in a uh, data-centric manner? So what are the sources of data in your organization? Um, what are the sinks? Where does that data go to? And how does the data flow? And uh, we'll look at vulnerability data. We'll look at detection and, pre uh, and prevention, uh, you know, WAF, IDS, IPS. Uh, we'll look at developer tools and how you can better communicate with the tools developers are already using. And we'll talk about rolling some of this data up and sending it up through risk management and GRC type systems. So again, in the absence of automation, you're doomed. Uh, you've got to automate everything possible because that frees up people cycles for people-only tasks and lets you start to say, you know, these are the things that I feel like I need to do to create appropriately secure software. Let's make automation do everything that it possibly can so that we can free up these very rare, very valuable people resources uh, to do the things that, they, uh, that they're supposed to be doing. The example application that we'll, uh, that we'll use for examples here is uh, ThreadFix, which is an application that we, we've developed. We've also got an uh, increasingly vibrant development community around it, which is, which is fantastic. And basically what it lets you do is create a consolidated view of the applications you have in your organization, as well as all of their vulnerabilities that they currently have or historically have had. <coughs> By treating all of this in a structured data manner, it lets you start to prioritize application risk decisions based on that data. So you can start to make decisions based on uh, you know, actual data and have a reason why you do things that you do as opposed to using gut instinct. Uh, and then finally, it lets you translate vulnerabilities to developers and the tools they're already using. And that's, again, one of the things we'll talk about that really helps to reduce friction 
um, you know, as you go out and try to reach out to development teams and try to get them to do what you want them to do. Uh, it's, uh, it's all available, uh, everything we're looking at today is available on GitHub, um, so please uh, download it, take a look. Uh, if you have any questions or comment, feedback is the breakfast of champions, so uh, you know, we're always happy to get, uh, to get uh, you know, feature requests, uh, bug reports, and whatnot. Um, and one of the things that we've done inside of ThreadFix is looked at these data sources, these data sinks, and we've created abstractions for those. And so there aren't a lot of standard data formats yet, or there are, are no real standard data formats that I know of in the software security world, although we're pushing for those, and I'll talk about that. Um, but we've created abstractions for those and adapters to the most common commercial and open source technologies that are out there. So this is a list, I think it's mostly up to date. There's a, also you know, a list online. Um, but of the you know, dynamic scanners, the static scanners, the uh, you know, SAS testing platforms, you know, all sources of vulnerability data. Uh, we can talk out to different IDS, IPS, or web application firewall systems. Uh, we can talk to a number of different defect trackers. There's one or two missing from that list. And, uh, and we're also now starting to incorporate um, reports from these known vulnerability scanners. Um, you know, for example, uh, Jeremy Long's excellent dependency check uh, tool. Jeremy in the audience? All right. He's around here somewhere. I saw him. <coughs> um, and so, and that's a sticker page that shows, shows all of that. But if we look at the vulnerability management process, you, know, you first need to detect that vulnerabilities exist. Right? Then you may want to provide some short-term mitigation to protect your organization, hopefully while you're making uh, your actual fixes to the underlying code. Um, and then you've actually got to remediate the vulnerabilities. And that's, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's a step that a lot of people kind of forget. Um, you know, who here does uh, some pen testing work, scanning work, stuff like that? Do you have problems finding vulnerabilities? Are you, like, are you just flummoxed <laughs> with each new application? <laughs> right. <laughs> so finding vulnerability, vulnerability detection is often not the problem. And I think this slide shows why, is we have a lot of great different ways to, you know, to identify this vulnerability data. On the automated side, we've got static scanning, we've got dynamic scanning, we've got the emerging uh, you know, integrated uh, you know, application security testing. Uh, you, we've got uh, you know, known vulnerable component scanning. I don't know if that's got a cool uh, acronym from the Gartner folks yet. Hopefully it's, hopefully it's coming. Um, you know, but so you've got all these different sources of data, and a lot of that can be automated, right? And so again, you, you want to figure out ways. How do we automate all of these, you know, configure and automate all of these different runs and flow all this data up into a centralized repository? And what we see here is there's a lot of challenges. Like this is a multi-vendor problem in organizations, even with modestly sophisticated software security programs. Um, is there anybody here that only has one tool that they're using to scan for vulnerabilities in their organization? Right. Well, those people would presumably be in another room. Um, <laughs> uh, because you know, the idea here is you've got a number of different vendors, uh, tools that are providing data, right? And if you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability identified by a dynamic tool or a cross-site scripting vulnerability identified by a static tool in an application, like I don't care where I found the vulnerability from. As long as it's not a false positive, uh, you know, like that's something that's going to have to be dealt with, right? We've also got these manual activities, threat modeling, indicating, uh, hey, here's a weakness in the design of your system that you need to address, manual code review, uh, and penetration testing to identify the types of vulnerabilities that you don't find, um, you know, that you don't find from, uh, uh, you know, from, from automated scanning. And so one of the challenges here is we see organizations get bogged down where they license, you know, scanner XYZ for the security team that generates a steady stream of 300 page PDFs with color graphs, right? Then they uh, you know, go to a static, or, you know, like a, an external software as a service scanning service that's doing some testing that generates you know, also uh, you know, uh, you know, 300 page PDFs. And maybe they've started to roll out static analysis in a development team or you know, across a, a set of development teams, which generates you know, a, a, another stream of uh, you know, 300 page PDFs. Um, and the inability to merge all this data together uh, causes a lot of problems because if you go to the dev teams, like the only thing worse than going to a dev team with a 300 page PDF is going in with a second 300 page PDF and saying, there's probably some overlap in these vulnerabilities. I just can't tell you where, right? <laughs> and, and that gives the development team every excuse in the world to push back and say, like, you are actively wasting my time. I'm going to go find my VP and he's going to he's going to beat your VP up and I'm not going to have to like, take your calls anymore. Right, it's 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 a horrible, horrible uh, negative interaction pattern that happens over and over again, and so one of the things that we did with ThreadFix is created an engine that can merge 
these dynamic to dynamic results, static to static results, and we'll also store that alongside the results of all the manual testing that you're doing. And so in a vendor independent way, ThreadFix lets you pull all this data in and dedupe it so that you get a unified list of the open vulnerabilities for an application so that you can start to look and say, all right, what do we want to address first? We're not going to necessarily go, uh, you know, like, well, first we're going to work our way through this report, and then we're going to work our, through, work our way through this report. You can say, I have a unified list of these vulnerabilities that we've identified. Let's slice and dice this data and make decisions about how we're going to proceed. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds of how we do the merging, um, but again, we've got a, a data format um, that you can look at that we've constructed. Um, <coughs> for what a standard you know, dynamic vulnerability looks like, a standard static vulnerability looks like, and a standard uh, known com vulnerable component vulnerability looks like. And we've created an engine that lets you merge those things together. Uh, and as I'll, uh, as I'll talk a little bit uh, in more detail about this later, but we've also worked with the US Homeland Security, a Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate to build what we call hybrid analysis mapping technology that lets you merge the static vulnerabilities with the dynamic vulnerabilities. And so the idea here is, <coughs> let's take all the data that we have from testing that we're doing and flow all of that into one place to get it deduped so that we have a single list of what our problems are. And that, I think, is, uh, we found that to be very powerful in organizations where they have multiple tools um, because that way you're not wrestling with the tools or wrestling with Excel. Instead, you can say, I'm going to load all this in, Make a, you know, the, the system's going to make a first pass. I might have to go in and make some tweaks, but I've been freed of cutting and pasting like all my static results and all my dynamic results into one spreadsheet and then trying to manually line those up. Um, you know, to do some benchmarking, we actually had uh, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our folks do that, and he did not enjoy that task. Um, <laughs> and it was, not the, it was not the best use of, uh, of, of, of a comparatively expensive asset's uh, you know, limited time. Um, you know, we also met back to the MITRE's CWE. Um, I don't know if Steve Christie's here. I like to say that the MITRE CWE is like the democracy of, uh, of, uh, of uh, vulnerability taxonomies. It's the uh, worst one out there except for all the other ones. Um, but uh, no, CWE has actually been, uh, been, been really good for us to help to map these different tools together. A lot of tools already have uh, you know, that stuff done. And so you know, how do you load vulnerabilities in? Um, and we've, from, from a data hub standpoint, you want to be able, you obviously need to be able to manually load vulnerabilities in, but you also need to encourage this automation. And so what we've done is we've exposed, you can manually upload files if you have historical data, but we also expose a REST API and a command line interface that wraps that REST API. And so if you have security testing that's being automated somewhere else, right, or if you have a, uh, you know, a set of historical files, you can script those interactions just to send that data in. And the goal here is to take advantage of any other automation that you have or make it worth doing this automation because once you have the results of that security testing, the data can just flow in. We also had a, a, a contribution uh, from the community of a Jenkins plugin um, from Brandon Spruth, who uh, did the automation domination talk last year uh, at, the, at OWASP AppSec US. Um, and so that's fantastic. So if your organization, if you're starting to push to the security teams and have them do, or I'm sorry, if you're starting to push to the development teams and have them start to incorporate some sort of a scanning, you know, maybe with an open source tool, maybe, you're, you know, maybe you've got a licensed uh, you know, static tool, but if you're starting to push those scanning activities into the developer's continuous integration process, you can take the results of that either via the command line or via the Jenkins plugin, grab those results and load it in. And so as developers develop and create incremental versions of the software, that data just flows up for you for free. You don't have to screw with it. Uh, and that's something that we've done internally for our systems a lot, where we use Jenkins for a lot of the orchestration. Um, you know, we use the, our command line tool to do a lot of uploads. Um, we've got some custom scripts that we use to package data and send it out to third-party services and, and different tools. Um, you know, we use a dependency checks Maven plugin to do uh, runs of dependency check and flow that data in. And so, uh, you know, on a schedule, you know, we don't necessarily do this with every build, but on a you know, weekly or, or bi-weekly basis, all of these different scanning or testing activities that can be automated are being run and that data all flows up into that central location. Now, that's a picture of our Jenkins. The uh, text, if you can read it, says, please don't screw anything up. Um, if you want to mess with something, contact one of these folks. So uh, yeah, please don't screw anything up in the Jenkins plugin. But like, we found that to be a very effective way to get a good pattern of contribution of fresh data into the system. Um, you know, again, it, depending on how your organization is working, you may, uh, you know, that may, it may work better or worse for you all. 
Um, and so when you load these scan results in, what ThreadFix does is it diffs them against the previous scans so that you can identify when vulnerabilities appear and when they go away. Um, you can also identify when vulnerabilities resurface. And it merges across the different tools, again, to give you that single unified list. Uh, if you go in and mark things as false positives, that decision is durable. So if you go and flag a bunch of false positives and then re-upload a scan from that scanner, you don't, you're, you're not going to see it again. And then we do this normalization, SAS to SAS, DAS to DAS, and SAS to DAS with the hybrid analysis mapping. And so just to give you an idea of what that looks like. And so what you see here are, and I don't know how, that's all right. Uh, so what we see here are vulnerabilities. This cross-site scripting vulnerability was identified by AppScan, Arachni, and W3F. This one was identified by AppScan and Arachni. And so when you've got these repeated results that reflect the same underlying vulnerability, again, as an analyst, you just get a unified list. <coughs> and, uh, and, and, and you can figure out what you, what you want to do with that from there. Also, having all this stuff in a structured data format lets you go in and start to ask questions. You can go in and say, show me all the findings that were identified by more than one scanner, because maybe I consider those to be less likely to be false positives. Maybe I consider those to be you know, easier to identify um, you know, with automation. And so you can go in and start to prioritize and say, hey, these are the vulnerabilities that I want to look at first, because more than one tool found them. And that makes me more scared about them. You know. You can also go in and uh, you know, say, well, show me all the things that were in you know, some certain directory. You know, go in and you know, because this stuff lives in here over time, you can go in and start to ask aging questions. You know, show me vulnerabilities that have been here for more than a certain amount of time, right? so that you can identify stuff that maybe is lingering out there that the development teams aren't fixing. As I mentioned, you can do that across uh, static to static, dynamic to dynamic. And also for certain languages and platforms, you can do that for um, you, you can do that for uh, static to dynamic. So here's a uh, you know here's a uh, I think it's a cross-site scripting vulnerability that was identified by AppScan and Fortify. And so the idea here is to allow you to load in this you know, load in all these data sources and get a cleaned up view of that data as your starting point that you can slice and dice as opposed to you know, you know, sitting with a pencil and your like, green visor and like, marking, through, uh, you know, marking through the printed out reports. <coughs> One of the things that would really make my life easier, if there's any vendors, uh, like scanner vendors out there, any scanner vendors out there? So there's one or two. Yeah. Uh, is a standard, some standard data format. That would make everybody's life way easier. right? <laughs> or at least it would make my life easier, which is really the life that I care the most about. Um, you know, <laughs> Uh, but so what we've done is we've crafted a, uh, a, a data format we call the simple, uh, you know, simple structured vulnerability language that can handle both static and dynamic results and multiple results per multiple findings per vulnerability based on uh, the lessons that we've learned uh, you know, imp implementing ThreadFix. Uh, that's available out on uh, OWASP GitHub. And there's also the OWASP DEF project that we're, uh, that we're basically we're trying to work to unify these. Um, so that we have a standard, and then again, the open source thread fix is essentially a reference implementation uh, to do that conversion. But what I would love to see is a world where all of the tool vendors start to output things in this format so that customers can start to slice and dice and merge this data together. Um, again, that's something that uh, you know, being able to manipulate this data in a structured manner is, uh, is, is, pretty, uh, is, is pretty important. As I also talked about, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security uh, funded uh, with, through the SBIR program, lots of acronyms in that sentence, uh, but their Science and Technology Directorate uh, helped fund this SAS to, DAS, uh, SAS to DAS mapping, which we have working right now for Java JSP and Java Spring. Uh, we've also got code written that still hasn't moved into the main line that does ASP.NET web forms as well as ASP.NET MVC. And we're going to be building that out to additional platforms. Uh, I think uh, ASP Classic, PHP, Django, Ruby on Rails. <coughs> and so what we're trying to do is make it so that for the most popular frameworks uh, and tools that you can load all this data in. And again, this merging process just works to give you that single unified view of, uh, of, of the data. What we found through the creation of that hybrid analysis mapping technology, basically it works by doing a very lightweight source code analysis and building a data model of the application that maps the attack surface points, like what is going to be dynamically exposed in this application, what URL, what parameters, and it maps that back to the underlying line of code that is re responsible for that. 
And so that lets us match between the static and dynamic results. That's the mechanics of how that works. But it also lets us do some interesting stuff that lets us do things like we can clean up RESTful scanner results because we know what the URL patterns are going to look like. And when you combine that knowledge of the structure of the application's URLs with the results of a, uh, of a dynamic scanner, you can collapse the situations where the scanners are finding, like here's you know, pets slash one slash whatever is the same as pets slash eight slash whatever, right? Um, so, so that's another thing that we found is once you've got that structured data and a model of what the application looks like, you can start to do some cool additional cleaning of the data that makes it easier for you to go in and work with this stuff. Uh, what you can also do, and that's completely unreadable and I apologize, uh, but it's readable in the downloads. Uh, what you can also do is basically take that database that we create and do a select star on it so that you can dump an application's entire attack surface out Right, so that you know, here's every URL that the application will respond to, every request that the application should respond to, as well as all the parameters that you should be able to pass in. And you can use that to identify hidden landing pages that you wouldn't find from a crawl, or that you wouldn't, uh, you, know, you know, again, hidden landing pages, uh, you know, things that a crawler might not find if it's a multi-step process, or if there are debug parameters that you wouldn't find in a crawl, but that the application will respond to. Right, and so given that data, you can actually feed that data to scanners, and we've got plugins right now for OWASP Zap and for, uh, for uh, Burp Suite. You can feed that attack surface data in to seed their scans, to, you know, to seed that process, so that you can help reduce false negatives. You can find vulnerabilities in parts of the application that you might not otherwise exercise. Uh, so again, the value of having this structured data of what an application looks like, the structured data of what one tool finds for vulnerabilities, when you start to combine these things, you get better results out of the tool, and you get better more human usable results once you make a pass over this data to clean it up. <coughs> and so that's a, uh, you know, those, uh, you know, by combining those things, you're able to get a much cleaner view of the vulnerabilities in your application or in your systems, um, you know, with uh, a lower degree of work. Uh, so that's vulnerability discovery. Now let's look at vulnerability mitigation, <coughs> where uh, we've got all the structured vulnerability data, right? Who could that possibly be useful for? One group that could possibly use this are the folks that are operating your sensors that are trying to protect your networks and operation. So if you have web application firewalls, if you've got intrusion detection, intrusion uh, uh, you know, prevention systems, you know, that data is potentially valuable. All right? And despite, you know, again, all of these uh, devices, they have an idea of what good traffic looks like and what bad traffic looks like. Most of the WAFs try to create a model. You know, they do some sort of learning to try to understand what the application looks like. But uh, again, that model is prone, you know, is, is, is an imperfect model. And what you can do with this vulnerability data is feed it to these systems and say, hey, I know you're trying to guard against all these things. You want to be extra vigilant guarding against cross-site scripting in the username parameter that goes to log, you know, uh, login.jsp. Because we know there's a vulnerability there, so you can step up your protections there and hopefully increase your successful blocks and uh, you know, if you have the ability to dial back your other uh, your protection rules, uh, you can potentially decrease the false blocks. And so again, if you've got this data in a structured format, you can start to make your investment in scanning also pay dividends for your investment in these detection and blocking technologies. Uh, and so here's an example, again, not super readable, but available online, where you can take this data, use it to generate virtual patch rules, and you can install those on systems and then potentially pull the log data back in so that you see, I've got 100 cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. I generated 100 virtual patch rules, right? Let these run for a while. Five of those rules are getting tripped all the time. OK, well, that's data that I might use to prioritize remediation to say, if I can only fix five vulnerabilities, I'm going to fix the five that are getting beat up, uh, you know, that are, that are uh, you know, potentially that are ones under attack. And so again, you know, by treating this stuff in a, in a, in a structured data-based manner that flows through a central location, you can generate these virtual patch rules and then look at the effect that those virtual patch rules are having. You know, talked about this a little before. You know, this is a pretty common uh, you know, security approaches to development teams. And uh, you know, hey, here's the PDF. Here's two PDFs. No, I won't take two PDFs. OK, well, now I made you an Excel spreadsheet. Right? Thank you. <laughs> like, that's so much better than PDF. There was a blog post a while back that says, you know, send me your data. PDF is fine. I don't know if anybody remember reading that. I can't remember who wrote it. Just uh, like the, the title of that really, really struck home for me because, like, oh, hey, you got a bunch of data. Yeah, I do. Cool. Send me a blob that I can't, uh, that I'm not going to be able to do anything with other than like kill some trees to print it out and, uh, you know, and then like, you know, work through it with my highlighter. <coughs> 
you know, a little bit better than that is uh, you know, going to the developers and say, hey, log into this new system that's slightly less completely egregious. Um, you know, and it's like, well, you've got your systems and I've got my system. An ultimate approach here is like, actually, like, let's, let's look at what the developers are doing. Like, let's understand a little bit about the plight of the developer and take advantage of the stuff that they're already using. And, uh, you know, I, I hear a lot of times, and I, I remember uh, this uh, security curmudgeon, I was giving a talk at B-Sides Austin a couple years ago about mobile security or something. I guess guy in the back of the room was like, ah, oh, if the developers stop writing such crappy code, you know, our lives would be a lot easier. And I'm like, wow, I bet you're a real hit at the office Christmas party. <laughs> you know? But that's the attitude that far too many security folks take, right? And what I've found in working with developers, it's not that developers don't care about security. You know, a lot of them don't know about security, uh, and, and John will talk about that uh, next. But you know, it's not the developers want to write not secure code, but they have to care about security in addition to caring about performance problems, and in addition to caring about bugs, and most importantly, in addition to caring about features promised by a hotshot VP to an important customer, right? And so you know, developers have a limited set of time, you know, eight, eight hours a day more if you give them Jolt Cola uh, or Red Bull or whatever, whatever the kids drink these days, you know, monster energy drink. <laughs> um, yeah, but they have a limited amount of time, and so you need to make fixing security bugs as inexpensive or as easy as possible, right? And handing somebody a PDF with sticky notes is not making that easy. It's actually making it hard. <laughs> and so you really need to take advantage of the tools and the processes that they're already using. Uh, and uh, you know, again, in analyst speak, it's application lifecycle management tools. I'm more of a bug tracking tool kind of guy. But if you've got all this vulnerability data in the data hub, pu start pushing the tasks that you want developers to undertake push those into the systems that they're already using to do task management, right? Almost every development team I've ever worked with that's, uh, you know, that's doing anything, like they've got Jira, or they've got HP Quality Center, or they've got Bugzilla, or they've, they've got some sort of defect tracking system and a series of meetings that they use to pick, you know, what's the work that we had to do, which work items are we gonna do, okay, let's go ahead and do this, right? And so if you can use those systems that they're already using, that's going to take a lot of friction out of the process because you're not saying, hey, for 95% of your life you're using all these systems and processes, but because I'm the special security snowflake, I want you to use this other thing that I'm going to give you, right? The special security snowflake melts, right? It's, <laughs> it's not, not a good place to be. And so you need to look at, like, how do we want to take this vulnerability data, not just using the system, but how are we going to package it up to be respectful of how developers do work? Right? If you run a scan with 500 cross-site scripting uh, vulnerabilities and you turn those into 500 defects, the QA manager will murder you in the parking lot. Right? Because it's going to take longer to administer those defects than it's going to take to actually fix the bugs. But if you start to you know, cluster these and say, well, let's bundle up, you know, fixing uh, you know, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, you're using a lot of the similar encoding libraries, let's bundle those up together in paths that are sensible for the developers. Right? Or maybe you, you know, ran a scan, found something that has to do, uh, you, know, you need an out-of-cycle release for, combined by severity. If you know that one developer, if you're know, working with the dev team lead, you know that one developer uh, you know, owns one piece of the code and it breaks whenever, whenever anybody else touches it, you know, maybe you want to package all the stuff in the checkout process and ship it over to Joe. Right? But this is an opportunity to work with development team leads, say, like, how do you guys want to see this stuff packaged? All right? We're going to slice and dice that data, and we're going to send it over to you in the format, that, you know, in the tool that you're already using, and in a format that's going to make sense when it gets there. Again, looking at how do we take the you know the friction out of this uh, how do we take the friction out of this process? Uh, and so again, in ThreadFix, you can basically use those same criteria that we looked at before. You know, show me you know show me all the cross-site scripting, show me anything that's over a week old, uh, so on and so forth. You can slice and dice the vulnerability like that. Say, I want to grab all these vulnerabilities, package that up into a defect report, ship it over to whichever defect tracking system that the developers are using. And so you can install, you can connect it to multiple defect tracking systems, um, you know, ship this data over, and then ThreadFix wakes up periodically, calls home, and says, you know, for all the vulnerabilities I've created, let's check the status. <coughs> and so what that lets you do basically is to go through and say. Go through and say. I've shipped these vulnerabilities over. Those are still open in the Jira system. I've shipped these vulnerabilities over. The developers think these have been closed. OK, I'm going to rerun the Fortify scan that identified those particular vulnerabilities. And the desired behavior is that those vulnerabilities drop off the map. If those vulnerabilities remain, OK, well, now we need to take a look. 
right? This may be an opportunity to go reach out to the dev team and say, hey, you guys think you fixed this vulnerability, but you actually use the HTML encoding functions to fix the SQL injection vulnerability, which although I admire your pluck uh, <laughs> and, and your initiative, which, which are great, <laughs> I think you'll find you may be more successful if you use the uh, you know, parameterized queries or a proper SQL encoding library. Right. And so, again, this is an opportunity to let these things flow through as they should and to identify the exceptional cases so that you, as a security analyst, can jump in and actually help to fix, you know, fix the problems that need fixing, not to monitor the problems that actually got fixed the way that you wanted them to get, to, you know, to get fixed otherwise. Another thing to understand about developers is you know, they spend a lot of time uh, you know, in the defect tracking system. They also, also spend a lot of time in the IDEs. And one of the things that we found to be really helpful is like, how do you push into an IDE? Like, how do you push as much data as you can so that developers can go and highlight those different, uh, you know, highlight where they need to make code changes? Again, how do I understand what tools the developers are using and reduce the friction out of the process? And so we've also built plugins uh, right now for Eclipse and for IntelliJ. Uh, and we're going to be building a Visual Studio plugin as well. <clears throat> but basically, that can connect and pull down that vulnerability data. And the, the static folks have been able to do this forever, and it's great and, and fantastic. Uh, one of the additional interesting added benefits that we got from the hybrid analysis mapping technology that's in there is we can take those dynamic scan results, query the database that we build, map that back to the line of code, and actually flag that line of code. So even if you haven't done static scanning, if you've done dynamic scanning and can run those results through the application attack surface model, you can, in a lot of cases, identify the starting point line of code. You know, it's not as good as you get with a lot of the static plugins where you have the full control flow or the full data flow, but it's a lot better than saying, like, eh, you know, on this page, you know, the such and such parameter, good luck tracking that down. You know, in certain systems, you know, in PHP or something, that's usually pretty easy. But if you've got a framework like Spring or something like that, you know, the page where, like, the actual code construct where this exists might not be super close to where the, uh, you know, where the, uh, where the stuff is. And so, again, we've got plugins that'll help you identify where you can pull this data over. You know, you know finally, you know, looking at it from a risk management standpoint. You know, this data hub, like the primary consumer of this data hub is going to be the software the application security program folks, the software security program folks. Uh, but you know, other, there's other stakeholders that need to know about this stuff. You know, your compliance people, uh, you, know, you need to be able to provide them a view into the data or ship this data into the systems that they're using so that they get what they need. Right? Your compliance officer probably doesn't need to know every parameter in the web application that's vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Right? Maybe they're thorough uh, and, and do know that. Or if you gave them that information, they would actually have the ability to consume it in a meaningful way. Um, but uh, again, in most organizations, that's not, a, uh, you know, that's not the priority. Right? They want to know, well, hey, make, you know, slice and dice this data and send this up to me so that I know, you know I've got a, a dashboardy view or something like that. You know, and so you can look at pulling data out of the data hub and feeding it to GRC systems or other, uh, other management stakeholders. And this is also where you can go in and use that vulnerability filtering to take whatever policies your organization has and start to save those so that you can run queries, right? And so if we go in here and we can say, again, show me, you know, show me every vulnerability that we've ever found that was found by more than two vulnerabilities, right? Or show me every cross-site scripting vulnerability. Show me every cross-site scripting vulnerability you know, that we have in the system. All right. But you can also start to do more interesting things and save those as filters. So that you can say, show me all the cross-site scriptings that we have that are over 90 days old. All right. So across our entire enterprise, across all the scanning we're doing, static, dynamic, interactive, you know, whatever other stuff we have, show me all the cross-site scriptings that we have that are over 90 days old. Because right? maybe you have a rule that cross-site scripting has to get fixed in 90 days. Or maybe you have a rule that all critical and high vulnerabilities have to be addressed in 30 days, right? So you can create filters for stuff like that, and either, you know, either, uh, you know, you know, go through and export that to CSV. But you can also access this via the uh, via the REST API, and so you can pull this out as JSON data if you need to transform that, put it in a report format, or do some other sort of transform that you need to do to ship that around. And so, again, the value of having all of this data in a structured manner 
is that you can start to slice and dice it. You can start to ask questions of it and make decisions based on the answers that you get, which is something that you like simply don't have the ability to do if you're, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if you're trying to look at this in, in a bunch of silos or a bunch of unstructured data. Uh, another interesting thing that I think, uh, from a metric standpoint, that I think is really interesting is looking at your mean time to fix. You know, and so you can look at the application at the team or at the enterprise level and ask questions like, you know, for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, what percentage of those have we fixed and how long did it take for us to fix them on average and what's the average age of the remaining one? And so having data like that about your internal program across whatever technologies you're using, that lets you start to benchmark yourself against these third-party data sets that are starting to become available from folks like White Hat and folks like Veracode. All right. And this puts you, again, in a position to have a grown-up conversation. Hey, other organiza our peer organizations address 90% of cross-site scripting uh, in 50 days. We're addressing 60%, and our average close time is 75 days. You know, we're falling out of step with our peers. We need to spend more. We need to devote more resources to remediation because we're falling out of step with our peers. Or you say, hey, we're fixing 100%. The average fix time is 25 days. Clearly, I deserve a bonus for my effective use of the scarce resources you've given me. You know, as I like to say, like, you, know, you can lie with the statistics however you want. The nice thing about this is this auto-calculates your statistics for you. Right? Uh, and I think that that mean time to fix vulnerability is a really critical one. You, know, you can do other very interesting things with this vulnerability data. For example, looking to see what, you know, for this team, what, are, what, what vulnerabilities do they find? They have a lot of cross-site scripting but no SQL injection? Cool. Well, let's tune the training that these folks are going to receive to optimize for that. <clears throat> but really, for what I like about mean time to fix is that you can treat it like, uh, <clears throat> you can treat it like incident response, right? Uh, you know, Schneider's talked about, uh, you know, look at incident response. You know, you can treat this data hub as your SIM for your software security program. And the analog here is that your, you know, the newly identified vulnerabilities or events and your mean time to fix is essentially your effectiveness in that incident response. Like, over the road, you can start to use this data to optimize the program to say, what do we need to do to, you know, to eradicate these different things? Um, but I think that mean time to fix, uh, especially as you're starting out, is great because what that says is we accept for now that we're going to introduce vulnerabilities. Let's see how, we, how good we can get at finding them quickly and getting them resolved as quickly as possible. Uh, and again, by having all this data in a single place, that lets you start to, uh, let, lets you start to see all this. Um, so what have we covered? You know, application security is hard. Lots of people involved, that's the worst part. Uh, lots of systems involved, that's at least the tractable part. Uh, you know, data trumps FUD, especially if you want to look at a sustained uh, campaign. Uh, and, and automation is crucial. Uh, again, in, in the absence of automation, you're, you're going to really have a lot of trouble. Um, there's a couple of links, um, you know, again, to the GitHub site and whatnot. And if you need to track me down, I'll be here uh, today and tomorrow. Um, so if you have any questions, for, I think I have a minute or two for questions now. Yeah, okay, a couple of minutes or two for questions, yes. Uh, what do you mean by product? Well, let's say you have a development group that's doing uh, one, uh, one, one particular product, and then you acquire a different company who got their own product. Uh -huh. Could you merge the data hub? Yeah, I mean, and, and so like each data hub, you know, you should, uh, or at least in the way that we've built out ThreadFix, you've got, you, can, you take your world and you divide it up, and we've got teams that are building software in different applications. And so in a case like that, you would say, we acquired a company. Cool, we're going to add one or more teams, and, uh, and this will not stay on that slide. Uh, you know, we're going to add one or more teams, you know, put the application under there, possibly load in the historical data, and start to capture all of our incremental testing and scanning that we're doing on top of that. Uh, and so the, 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 you get the most value, I think, when you sit on top of all of the different software assurance activities, because that lets you make assertions about your program, again, across technologies that you're using, as well as um, you know, across all the different teams. Because then you can start to say, hey, we trained this team and vulnerability introduction went down. Or we trained this team and it didn't go down, maybe I hate training. Um, you know, similarly, you can look across the different technologies and say, well, technology A is identifying lots of vulnerabilities, but it's also finding a bunch of false positives. Uh, maybe I want to replace that with technology B that might not find as much, but that is, uh, um, you know, but that is, uh, you know, has, is, is easier, no, no false positives. All right, I think I'm out of time here. So, uh, but I'll be around uh, again today and tomorrow. If you have any questions, track me down. Uh, and feel free to shoot me an email or track me down on Twitter. So, thank you all.